Thank you, ladies. Just the other week, uh, you were probably aware of the fact that uh, Tom Bizarro and I were away, um, actually uh, out of the country in Peru as part of our ongoing uh, partnership to try to get a church planted in uh, the village, the town of Chupa. Anyway, I was, uh, especially those of you who are in close proximity to me, were probably aware of the fact I was really, really nervous uh, before going. I mean, sincerely, in fact, I remember the morning that Tom picked me up, I said, I am wound as tight as a drum, among other reasons, because I, I've never really been anywhere. Like, I've been to, like, Reedsville and, um, um, yeah, I, I've been to the, like just places stateside, but I've never left the country, much less uh, never left the continent. And so I was uh, unsettled about all of that. It was a completely new experience for me. Uh, because of that, in particular, in the, in the days leading up to the trip, I was asking a lot of questions. I asked Tom a lot, I asked Shep a lot, uh, trying to do as, as much as I could to, to prepare myself to remove as many surprises as possible. And so uh, among the things that they were sharing with me, some of which you, you would expect, uh, one of the biggest ones is not to drink the water. And so only drink uh, water from a sealed water bottle. And so stay away from ice when you're in a shower. Don't you stand there with your mouth open. And so th that's important. Uh, something else that was kind of shocked, not shockingly, but uh, it was important that you should really pay attention to. I was unaware that the, the, the U.S. is one of the few countries in the world where you can actually flush toilet paper. So when you go to Peru, don't do that. Plumbing system's not uh, suitable to, to, to deal with that. That's an important thing to know before you go, right? Um, I promise I didn't write that. Anyway... Beyond that, the, the village where we're going, uh, Chupa, is at 13,000 feet in terms of elevation. And so it's about 40% less oxygen. And so um, Shep and Tom had both told me, listen, don't be surprised if you wind up with a dull headache. Um, it could be that you could get winded or feel winded uh, pretty quickly. So, so don't be surprised. It, it's going to affect you. It could uh, cause you to have a decreased appetite. and The number of things because your body is not accustomed to operating at that al altitude. That was pretty important. One of the things, though, um, that, that Tom had encouraged me as well, that I may want to take some snacks with me, uh, just put some of those in my suitcase, and I uh, had some crackers and a few things in there, but uh, the day before I left, Caroline had, had been to Aldi and uh, got me a small bag of beef jerky and said, here, you can put this in your, in your suitcase, and, and the, the day that Tom picked me up to go to the airport, uh, I, I asked specifically, I said, in terms of snacks, is there anything I need to be uh, on guard against bringing? He said, I wouldn't like bring any meat or anything like that. And uh, like beef jerky or something. And the reason for that is because in, in Lima, he said, there's, when you get to the airport, as you go through customs, they've got a, 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 some type of beagle that's a, a luggage inspection dog. And he said, uh, at one point before, he had had some beef jerky in his suitcase, and the beagle goes crazy about that. And you don't want to be going through customs in a foreign country. You don't want, you don't want the dog's attention. You don't want any, you just want to kind of go on smoothly through. Anyway, hearing all of this was very helpful for me. Hearing all of this was, uh, was beneficial to me because I am going somewhere and I want that experience to go as smoothly as it possibly can. And so for that to occur, I want to benefit from the experience of those who have already been there before. I want to, to learn things to do and things not to do as well. Now that, certainly that's true relative to physically going on a trip. But I want you to realize this. If you are someone who professes to have a relationship with God, among other things, something is true. You are walking with God. You have a walk with God. And the, the walk that you have with God is one where God is leading, and he's charting a course, he's charting a path. God is seeking to take you somewhere. There are experiences that he wants you to to have. There are maybe even geographic destinations to which he may want you to go. But regardless, the, the reality is this. If you have a relationship with God, you have a walk with God, and God is seeking to take you somewhere. Well, if that is the case, and I believe it's certainly the case, I believe that's absolutely made clear in the pages of Scripture, wouldn't you want that walk to go as smoothly as it possibly can? 
Well, one of the ways that you can ensure that that walk with God goes smoothly is to pay attention to the example of and from the, to the experience of those who have already been walking with God. And that's what we're going to begin doing today uh, with a new series that I'm calling Road Trip. And in short, what we're looking at is this. The experience of the people of God in the Old Testament from the time they leave Egypt until they get to the Promised Land. So they're actually on a trip. They are physically and spiritually walking with God. And their experience can teach us a great deal, if we'll pay attention to it, that will ensure that our walk with God goes smoothly, that we don't hit some of the same uh, potholes and landmines that they wound up stepping on. And so over the next eight weeks, uh, beginning today, we're going to be looking at some of the twists and turns in their walk with God so that we might learn lessons for our own journey. We're going to begin today, though, in Exodus chapter 13 in Exodus chapter 13 and what we're looking at at this point is the Israelites are getting ready to formally begin their journey and before they leave before you go there's there's some lessons some principles that we can see that God is uh, revealing about himself and the ways in which he guides that if you pay attention to will have a significant impact on your walk with the Lord as well Exodus chapter 13 as, as you turn there and before we actually start looking at the verses beginning in verse 17 let me set the context for you in terms of what's going on if you were to go back into around the the middle of the book of Genesis you're introduced to a guy hopefully you're familiar with whose name was Joseph you remember Joseph was the favorite of his of, of his brothers favored by his father and you remember the whole coat of many colors and all of that that favoritism was so pronounced it did not put him in good stead with his brothers and long story short they sell him off as a slave and he winds up eventually in Egypt perhaps you recall that he goes through the ranks and is finally uh, able God opens up doors and Joseph becomes effectively the prime minister of Egypt so the only person that he doesn't, or the only person that he answers to is the Pharaoh himself. Everyone else in the nation answers to Joseph. You recall towards the, the end of the description, the narrative as to what's going on in Joseph's life, that there was this great famine. And long story short, Joseph, his brother, or excuse, Joseph's brothers, their spouses, their children, even and Joseph's father, all of them, they wind up coming because of that famine to Egypt. The relationships are able to be restored. And Joseph, because he's the prime minister, he's got connections. He really sets them up to live and to live well in Egypt. Well, it, it's, it's a sizable group to begin with, but it doesn't take very long before that group of individuals that we come to know later as the nation of Israel before they are exceedingly numerous and as the generations unfold you've got different leadership in Egypt you've got a new Pharaoh and he is quite concerned that he's got a large group essentially of foreigners who are in Egypt and at any point they could decide you know what we want to overtake this nation and so what he wants to do is to keep them under his thumb and how he does that is to enslave them and so for 400 years, what we know is the nation of Israel is enslaved in Egypt. But while they are serving as slaves in Egypt, they are looking forward to something that God has repeatedly communicated to them, which is that there is this, this land of amazing promise, amazing beauty, it's fertile soil, it is the ideal, it's the dream place to be able to have children, to build homes, to have businesses, to have farms, to have all of this. And it was referred to them, or referred to by them as the promised land, or Canaan. And so for generations they kept looking forward to the, to the point and place where finally they would be able to experience the promised land, but they're still baking bricks, part of the construction project in Egypt. Things are really bad for them, but you remember that out of that nation comes a, a young man whose name is Moses. And God puts a call on Moses' life to effectively become the leader of his people. 
And among other things, God has the plan that Moses will be used by the Lord to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt and finally to the promised land. Now, I've unpacked stacks of chapters going from Genesis even through the first 13 chapters of Exodus. You want to read more about that and some about, for example, the plagues that occurred in Egypt where finally the Pharaoh said, hey, you guys get out of here. Read the first 13 chapters of Exodus. That'll give you some greater context. So all of that has occurred. The, the final plague has occurred, and Pharaoh has said to Moses and the children of Israel, you guys get out of here. So they have left, but they're not just leaving Egypt. They are actually going somewhere. They're not just kind of aimlessly wandering. There is a specific direction that they are headed and a specific destination to which they are going. And that, of course, is the promised land. They're headed to Canaan. Now, I don't want to suggest to you today that, that you have your own promised land, that there is some Canaan out there that awaits each of us. But what I am saying is this. In every one of our lives... As followers of God, in your life as someone who professes to have a personal relationship with the Lord, God is seeking to lead you somewhere. He doesn't want you just to aimlessly kind of saunter in life and just experience life by trial and error. There are specific plans, specific purposes, specific paths that God is wanting and seeking to guide you down. And as you experience your walk with God, as you have your own journey with the Lord, you can significantly learn from the experiences of others so that that might go well. With all of that as background, we come to verse 17. Of Exodus chapter 13, we're told, When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them along the road to the land of the Philistines even though it was nearby. For God said the people will change their minds and return to Egypt if they face war. So he led the people around toward the Red Sea along the road of the wilderness. And the Israelites left the land of Egypt in battle formation. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the Israelites swear a solemn oath, saying, God will certainly come to your aid. Then you must take my bones with you from this place. They set out from Succoth and camped at Etham on the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to lead them on their way during the day and in a pillar of fire to give them light at night so they could travel day or night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night never left its place in front of the people. In just these few verses, we get a couple of significant principles that inform in very meaningful and positive ways our own personal walks with the Lord. And as as this passage begins, verse 17 says that as the children of Israel are leaving, Pharaoh has, has finally granted them permission to go. God is guiding them, but notice what it says, that God did not lead them along the road to the land of the Philistines, even though it was near by. I hope that you've got a sense of the geography of this area. If you don't, look in the back of your Bible. There's probably some maps or go on the internet this afternoon and see if you can and get a sense of what's going on. But hopefully, if you can envision Africa as a continent, you've got the upper right, the upper, the northeastern portion of Africa is where Egypt is. What connects it to the continent of Asia is what we know as the Sinai Peninsula. And so if you're going to leave Egypt, you're going to leave and go northeast through the Sinai Peninsula. And Canaan is going to be, and where where eventually they're going to settle, is just to the west of the Dead Sea, not far from what we know as current day Jerusalem. So if, if you're going to leave northeast Africa through the Sinai Peninsula to head to the far eastern coast of the Mediterranean just to the west of the Dead Sea, there are clearly, you can look at a map, there are ways to go that are shorter than others. You can make a long sweeping motion or you can stay close to the coast and get there much more quickly. What we're told here is that God does not lead them the most direct or the shortest Root. In fact, God leads them a longer distance. God leads them through a or down a path that would not only lead longer distance, but would also take more time. 
And as we, we see God doing this, it begins to communicate to us a principle about how God guides. And here it is. Here's the first one. God guides you fully aware of your limitations. God will guide you being fully aware of your limitations. Not only do I believe that to be a true statement, I believe it is true on a couple of fronts. First of all, on the physical level. So bear this in mind. God is guiding the children of Israel to the promised land, but he's not leading them the shortest way. He's leading them a longer way. It was going to take longer, involve more steps, involve more miles. It would be, therefore, more physically demanding, but God still does this. What does this say? It says that God led them, that God guided them, knowing that physically they could endure going the longer route. It says that God guided them being aware of their own physical limitations. He knew this was within their ability to manage. They could accept this. They could deal with this. Now, I believe in, in that reality, in particular for those of you who are older than I and further down the road than I am physically, this should come to you as an encouragement because you're aware, and many of you can attest in ways that I cannot personally yet, that the older you get, the more physical challenges you experience. Knees hurt, hips hurt, joints have to be replaced, eyesight stinks, hearing goes by the wayside, hair gets left on the ground somewhere. All kinds of stuff happens to us physically as we age, and so we tend to decrease in terms of physical ability. What I'm saying to you is this. As God guides you, he will, even in the winter years of life, guide you in such a way that it is clearly evident he is aware of your physical limitations. He knows what you're able to do. He knows what you're able to experience. He knows what is beyond your ability to do. Therefore, if you are 99 years old and uh, going around in your scooter, God's not going to, to, to lead you to, to run a marathon. He's not going to do that because that, that's not in keeping with what he knows to be your physical limitations. This should come as an encouragement to us that physically God is aware of, of our limitations and he guides us in such a way it bears out the fact he knows what's going on with our bodies but this passage communicates more than God's awareness of their physical limitations notice what it says God did not lead them along the road to the land of the Philistines even though it was nearby and here's the ultimate reason because God knew the people would change their minds and return to Egypt the text says if they were to face war now, the Philistines, if you've read much of the Old Testament or heard many of the stories of the Old Testament at all, you're aware this becomes a chronic enemy of the nation of Israel. And the Philistines were always looking to expand their influence and to expand their territory. And so here's the question. If God was to lead the children of Israel through Philistine territory, would they have just said, oh, yeah, come on through, come on through, and yeah, you can just go to the north of us and set up just as big as you want to be? No, they wouldn't have done that. They would have fought them and said, no, you're not coming through here. They would have absolutely faced a conflict. And God knew this. If they get pushback at this point, if they experience opposition at the hands of the Philistines, what would happen is that the nation of Israel, the people of Israel, would turn around and they would head back to Egypt, even if that meant them going back into slavery. It says that God knew their emotional limitations. He knew how, they were, how fear worked in their lives and that they would opt for a familiar misery rather than an uncertain success. Here's the question. If God had led them through Philistine territory, and if God led them to experience conflict with the Philistines, would God have given them victory over them? I believe without question. Now, I think as you, as you follow what happens in, in the, the chapters and the, the events to come, absolutely, if God was guiding them through Philistine territory, God would have ensured that they did so successfully. He would have granted victory to them. 
But this is also, I believe, true. God knew it would never even get to that point because as soon as the threat became realized, they would say, I'm not going to do this. We're heading back to Egypt. And that they would, they would rather and that they would choose to have a known misery rather than a unknown, uncertain success. Now, I believe that not simply to be true of the people of Israel, I believe that to be still true of us today. And that so many times in life, what we do and we are prone to do is to opt for familiar, period. Maybe I'm the only one, for example, in, in this way, but I don't believe it to be the case. Let's say I go somewhere and, uh, to eat. I go to a, a restaurant that's brand new to me. Maybe it's newly opened or just new to me. And I go for there for the first time and I look at the menu and I make a choice and, and I get something. If, if I'm satisfied with that, if I think that whatever they bring me tastes good, the next time that I go back, do you know what I'm prone to do? Get the same thing again. Like there's a, there's a, a, a Greek restaurant over on Market Street called Mythos. Some of you have been there. God clearly has made that restaurant. Direct. And I tell people, I say, it's wonderful. And they say, what do you get? The, 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 the number nine. I don't know, it's just the number nine. It's, it, it's what I always get. I always get that. If I, They're closed today, but if I were to go today, you know what I'd get? I'd, I'd get the number nine. That's what I always get. I, I don't venture out because, I don't know, if I've had something and I'm okay with, I get familiar with it, I'm prone to get that over and over and over and over again. Here's the question, though. If you do that at a restaurant, have you had the best thing on the menu? Maybe. Maybe not. It's possible even if you liked it, you might have had the worst dish on the menu. But you just don't know, right? But why don't you know? Because we tend to opt consistently for the familiar. And God knew that as he is leading the children of Israel, he was so aware not only of their physical limitations, he was aware of their emotional limitations. That at this point, if they were to experience any pushback at all, they would even opt to go back as slaves into Egypt. That they would take a known misery over an uncertain success. And so God steers them around the Philistines. So what does that tell us? Again, it tells us that God guides being fully aware of our limitations. As, as the text continues, by the time you get to, to verse 21, we're, we're told that the Lord went out ahead of them, which is to say that God is guiding. God is setting the course. God is establishing the path that they are to go. And as God guides them, he does so in a particular way. It says that he guided them in a pillar of cloud to lead them on their way during the day and in a pillar of fire to give them light at night. What exactly is Moses describing here? I don't, I don't really know. I mean, I know what a cloud is, but a pillar of cloud, I mean, the, the fact that you're describing a pillar suggests like an almost vertical column. I don't know, and a, and a pillar of fire? I, I could bore you with what people have suggested over the years, but the truth is none of us actually knows. We can speculate, we can hypothesize, but we don't know for certain because however God did this, then he hasn't done it since. It doesn't seem like he ever did this before. This was something that was unique to those circumstances. Nevertheless, though, it communicates to us, I believe, a principle. Because even though I believe sincerely God is not going to guide you or guide me with some cloud or some sort of light in the night sky, there is a principle in what God is doing here that I believe has application for all of us, which is this. God will guide you with clarity as the goal. Not only does God guide with your limitations in view, he does so with clarity as his goal. This is a simple yet altogether important principle, which is this. The people don't know where to go. 
They, they know they want to be out of Egypt. They know they don't want to be slaves anymore. They'd like to get to this promised land, but they don't even, they haven't seen pictures. They don't have, they don't have anything. They have the hope of experiencing better, easier, nicer life, experiencing freedom, no national sovereignty. They, they, they look forward to that. But the truth is they do not know where to go. But God has a place for them. God has a plan. God has a purpose for them. They, he doesn't, excuse me, the people don't know how to get there. They don't know to how to experience that plan. They don't know how to experience that purpose, but God does. And so the only way for them to experience it is for God to guide them. And what does this tell us? It tells us that God guided them clearly. That they knew where they were to go. Why? Because God wanted them to get there. Uh, when I pastored the church in Charlotte, the, uh, there was a, a group there that is a fundraiser. This group of ladies uh, did uh, a, a cookbook. A cookbook. I think some, uh, in years past, Gate City has done a cookbook before. And my connection with that was, uh, was kind of informative to me. I didn't really know how all this worked. But apparently, putting together a cookbook is nothing more than glorified plagiarism. I'm calling you out. You know what happens? You get recipes that you got from another cookbook that you've been using for years that you like, and you turn it in, and you know what you do? You put your name on it. All of a sudden, that, that, that now becomes your recipe. Anyway, I, I didn't know how that works, but apparently that, that's how cookbooks work. And uh, I guess originally there were only like 10 recipes, but over the years there have been all of these others that we just keep renaming who came up with it. But um, anyway, so, so that was kind of instructive. The other thing that was instructed to me is this, that when you're putting, this, putting together something like this, and because you're putting your name on it, you're not saying, hey, I want to give you a good... Um, liver and Brussels sprout casserole recipe, right? You want to come up with good recipes because uh, you want to be known for the stuff that tastes good, right? So uh, people would be submitting recipes, putting their name on it because they want to be known for good recipes. But something I discovered, though, is that everybody doesn't put or include all of their good recipes. There are some people who will not share good recipes, Again, God knows who you are. <laughs> I'll be honest with you, I don't get that. I mean, if I've got something that tastes good that other people think, yeah, that's really good, and they say, hey, uh, how do you make that? I'm prone, I think, to tell them. Now, I, I, believe, I, I draw the line, though, if you make your livelihood, if you've got a restaurant, if you've got a business of some sort where uh, you're making income based on it, you, yeah, you don't want to give everything. I mean, your livelihood depends on that. But if you're just cooking in the kitchen... Um, normal family meals, in my estimation, I think you ought to share it. But I know there are people who don't for various reasons. Even worse than that, though, are those who have a good recipe and they'll submit it, but they'll leave something out. <laughs> Sometimes it's a step, sometimes it's a particular ingredient. Maybe a specific spice. You will answer for that. <laughs> God will hold you to account for that. But I know that it is done. I know that it is done. Here's the question, though. Why would someone do that? Why would someone leave out a particular ingredient or maybe leave out a particular step maybe that you're supposed to do this with the eggs as opposed to just just be, there, there's some there's something specific in terms of process that you're supposed to do why would someone not include all of those details because they don't want anybody to have their exact recipe they don't want anybody to, to wind up at the exact place that I am able to to be at. Let me just tell you this. When and as God guides, he doesn't operate like that. God does not have as his aim trying to somehow trick you or to sneak something by you so that you miss a step, so that there's, there's something that's important that you just leave out. 
God wants to be very clear. Why? Because where it is that God is guiding you, he wants you to get there. And, and so there is no benefit, there is no incentive whatsoever for God to do anything other than being perfectly crystal clear as he leads. And we see him doing that with his people then. That, that during the day, it was uncertain as to which, it was not at all uncertain as to which direction they should go. It seemed that whatever this particular cloud was, it was distinctive and different than every other cloud. And whatever this was at night, not only was it something that they could clearly follow in the night sky, it would even illuminate their path so that they could walk not in complete and utter darkness traveling in the cool of the evening. It seems that God has prepared every contingency so as to ensure where they step, as God guides, they're able to follow him. Listen, I don't believe God to operate any differently today. I really don't. Now, that being said, I don't think that there's going to be a cloud when you step out tomorrow morning to go to work, to go to school, and all of a sudden there's a cloud to guide you to the bus stop or to guide you to your car, and that on the way home or you go out to the grocery store at night that there is some particular night light in the sky that you know exactly where to... I'm not suggesting that at all. What I am saying is this. As God operated with his people then, as they walked with him then, so too, I believe, he operates today, which is that he has every incentive and wants to be certain that you are not just aimlessly bouncing around in life, but that you are going to specific destinations, down specific paths, because God has plans and purposes for you. And if he doesn't clearly communicate that, you will never know it. If he doesn't specifically and clearly guide you, you will never experience it. And so God has every incentive, and I believe we have based on the testimony of his word, clear evidence that as he guides, he will do so absolutely with clarity. Now, again, it probably is not going to take the shape of a cloud, either of a pillar of cloud or a pillar of fire, whatever those things are. But I do believe that the greatest way that God guides today is through his word. And I want to be very clear about this. This is even clearer than a cloud. And as miraculous as it was for them to operate traveling at night, this is even clearer than a pillar of fire. And in so many ways, God has been so very specific that he uses his word as a guide to us so that you step here, not there. Go down this path, not that one. And it's not that God has given this so as to make you miserable to rein in on your parade, but so that you might be able to experience the ultimate plans and purposes that he has for you. So that, as he describes later for, the, for his people, that it might go well with you in the land. God's goal is to get you to experience the plans and purposes that he has. And the greatest way that he does that today is through his word. And it honestly cannot get any clearer than this. I can read this. I can see these words clearly on paper. But I, I get it. Some of you would say, you know what, I don't, um, I don't disagree with you. I'm not going to take you to task on that, Michael. But even though there's a lot of words and a lot of pages in the Bible, it doesn't speak to everything. I mean, there's circumstances about which there isn't a specific verse that I can look to that will tell me you should do this and not that. I hear you in that. I'm not going to argue that point. But I do believe this that the overwhelming majority of the things that we experience, if there is not a clear statement, there is at the very least a clear principle that makes the guidance that we follow altogether clear. Let me give an example. In terms of human relationships, God has established marriage as the foundational relationship, not only upon which the family and the community is built, but society itself. So it is God's plan and purpose that a man and woman might be joined in marriage. All right? God has been very clear. Uh, Paul's letters could not be more explicit that for those who are followers of God, that those who are believers do not marry unbelievers. There's no ambiguity in that. It could not be clearer. The only way you could arrive at a different conclusion is to not look at this. It's that clear. Now, that is clear, but what does the Bible say about Christians dating non-Christians? 
Is there a verse that you can look to for that? Well, I, there's not a specific verse, not neither in Old or New Testament. You could say, well, th this verse is that uh, relative to dating or, or relationships less than marriage, that you ought to do this. All right? I'll grant you that. If it is true, and it's without argumentation, that you don't, you just didn't wake up married one day, did you? You, 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 you date and then marriage. Well, if God has been very clear that marriage among believers is reserved for those who are believers, that we ought to be equally yoked, if it's whether two lost or two followers of Christ, whatever it is, we ought to be equally joined together. In what rational, sensible world is it even remotely possible that God would be okay with a believer dating a lost person. The only way that could happen is for you either to shut your Bible and not open it or you, for you to take your mind and shut it off. What I'm saying is that there are so many ways in which God has given absolutely abundantly clear principles in his word that even if the text does not speak to a spe in a specific way in a specific verse, the principles so many times are abundantly clear and the only way that we can mess, mess it up is to not pay attention to it or to say, God, you're wrong. Why does God operate this way? Because he wants us to experience and to get to the destinations where he is guiding us. He has no incentive. In fact, he's got every opposite incentive to, to, to shroud and to hide and to be ambiguous in his guidance. Because if he does that, you may screw it up. You may make a misstep. And so if there is going to be a failure in terms of arrival, God does not want the onus to be on his failure of guidance. And hear me in this, there will never be a failure in guidance. At the end of the day, this is where we kind of land. God has been and is so good and not only giving us the ability to know him and have a personal relationship with him, but we're able to have a walk with him where we're not just kind of, whoa, 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 whoa. but he actually guides us. He's leading us. Sometimes it's leading in terms of personal relationships. Sometimes it's leading in terms of financial decisions. Sometimes it's leading in terms of gospel conversations. Sometimes it's leading even in terms of where it is that we land geographically. But hear me in this, God guides if you're a follower of his God is guiding you and it may be that you say you know what I, I hear you in that but I don't feel like it doesn't seem to me that God's guiding me anywhere so, so what's the problem might it be that God is still waiting for you to follow him in the stuff about which he has already been clear that you keep waiting for the next step and God's waiting for you to just take the first one. Ultimately, this is where we land. We have a God who guides being aware of our limitations with clarity in view and there will never ever be a failure of guidance. So where's the weak point? It's a failure in following a failure in following. As you think about this morning, if you're someone who says that you have a personal relationship with the Lord, you're on a walk with Him. Not aimlessly, but you're headed somewhere. If you are uncertain, if you are unaware of the ways in which God may be leading, Let me just kind of cut to the chase and say the problem is not with God. He's attempting to guide. He's seeking to be clear. What he's waiting for is a dancing partner. What he's waiting for is for me and for you to actually follow. Will you bow your heads with me? Everything that we've talked about this morning is contingent on this first step, and that's having a personal relationship with the God who made you. 
And if you're here this morning and you say, Michael, even on that step, I'm kind of unsure. I'm uncertain. I don't know how to experience that. I don't know if I have experienced that. Let me just tell you, we can help you with that. That God has been very clear in his word how it is that we might know him in a way that changes everything in a way that brings about guidance, in a way that brings about hope, in a way that brings about encouragement, and certainly in a way that brings about eternal life. If you need help with that, I want you to do something. In just a moment, we're going to have a time of invitation. And if you're comfortable in doing this, will you just leave where you are and come share that with me? If you're not, find me afterwards. Find Find one of us afterwards, and we want to share with you how you can know this how you can have a relationship with a God who wants to guide you, who's got plans and purposes that he wants you to experience. If you say, Michael, I've already crossed that threshold. I've been in this walking with God experience and maybe even for a while, some of you for multiplied decades. It is entirely possible that some of you would say today, I don't, uh, I don't really know what God wants me to do at all. In fact, the last time I felt certain as to the direction I should go, that's been a long time. Again, let me just remind you, I do not at all believe that to be a failure on God's part in terms of His guidance. Where the boat has been missed is in the area of following. And maybe what it is that God is waiting for you to say, Lord, there's been a lot of steps that I haven't taken after you. And I can't take all of those steps this morning, but I want to take one step towards you today and say, Lord, I want to leave this place walking with you. And maybe already there's some steps that you know that God wants you to take, some specific decisions that he wants you to make. Will you make that step? Will you make that decision today? Maybe one of the steps God's leading you to make is to formally connect with this church family. There's no better time like the present. Maybe there's some other thing that God is leading you to do, some conversation he's leading you to have with someone else, a a conversation to have with him. I just believe that even right now, God is guiding, and my hope is, as he is clear, that you will clearly follow. Lord, one of the passages that most of us are familiar with is the 23rd Psalm where, among other things, David communicates and describes you as a shepherd to your sheep and that you lead us in the paths of righteousness. Every person here today, you are either in the process or hope to be and desire to be guiding them. Even now, Lord, there may be steps that you are guiding them to make. And whatever those are, whatever shape and form they take, I pray, God, that we will be as good a follower as you are a leader. We commit this time of decision to you in Christ's name. Amen. As God is guiding you this morning, won't you come? I'm going to ask you.